From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. All of my friends will tell you, I'm a prime target for the new, new thing. Mike Allen bolts from Politico, where I've read him since he bolted from the Washington Post, starts up something with Jim Vandehei called Axios, I'm one of the first to sign up for his new newsletter. I'm skiing with my friend Kim Nemzer, who tells me that the company where she's CMO, Warby Parker, has a new frame named after quarterback Tom Brady. I'm online in a flash, ordering up a pair of prescription Brady's so I can be like the greatest of all time. Then I look at photos by Jillian Laub of Jeff Sprecher, the chairman and CEO of Intercontinental Exchange, for an article that's about to appear in Fortune featuring a shot of Jeff working on a Porsche in his garage. My eye goes not to the car, but the soft black sneakers he's wearing on his pristine floor. What are those? I ask a friend. All birds, comes the reply. For me, another trip online. A few minutes later, Always that easy, direct-to-consumer shopping experience we've come to expect from the hot new brands, and two new pair of the featherweight footwear are headed my way. Allbirds, Warby Parker, Axios, what's the common denominator? Without Eric Hippo, managing partner at venture capital firm Lehrer Hippo, none of my new acquisitions might have been possible. Eric is a part of the team turning entrepreneurial dreams into reality and fueling startups into the fastest growing brands today. Yes, Eric, as you can see, I'm available to beta test your next new, new idea. My home in the West Village puts me near ground zero of all of the action. The path of the innovating entrepreneur is seemingly formulaic. Create an idea, move to San Francisco or Palo Alto, and access the capital and technology needed to take an idea to a new reality. So why did Eric decide to choose the path of Frank Sinatra? If I can make it here, I'll make it anywhere. New York, New York, as a cradle of startup creativity. We'll find out why, in Eric Hippo's view, it might just be the beginning of the song. That's right after this. Cushman & Wakefield is one of the premier brands in the commercial real estate services space. We have 48,000 professionals around the world in 400 offices in 70 countries. This company, 101 years old, if you can imagine, has never been public. There's a reason they call the NYSE the big board. It's a great home for companies like us, big companies with big ideas. Cushman & Wakefield, now listed on the NYSE. Lehrer Hippo is an early-stage venture capital fund with its roots firmly planted in New York City's Soho neighborhood. Since its launch just eight years ago, the firm has provided the initial investments for wildly popular media, retail, and tech brands, including Allbirds, Axios, BuzzFeed, Casper, Everlane, Jiffy, Glossier, Warby Parker, and many, many more. As they like to say, they're not investing in the companies— They're investing in the people who run them, and they're focused on building relationships that grow into long-form partnerships. And from the looks of this list, I've got so much more to buy. Welcome, Eric Hippo, Inside the Ice House. Hi, Josh. How are you? You're no stranger to the NYSC as a regular on CNBC from their post-9 position, where you talk about everything from Facebook privacy to our FANG stocks. What's on top of mind in the news cycle for you right now? There's a new dynamic going on, the backlash, as we've seen perhaps with Facebook and Google, certainly in terms of the overall privacy issues that are being discussed at the moment. So the political world is kind of waking up to the fact that the whole world is changing and changing rapidly, and they, the politicians, might not be entirely ready for all of this. 
Amazon last week in the throes of so many other media issues with Jeff Bezos and AMI and National Enquirer. Where should we as sort of a New York City resident look at where this deal stands and why last week did sort of these issues begin to come to the fore? Well, I think we have to take a step back. And, and we, we just saw uh, Mayor de Blasio kind of complain that the, the budget might have to be reduced because the earnings or the, tax, the, the taxes that are being levied on Wall Street might be smaller given what happened at the end of last quarter. And we, we just have to take a step back and, and realize that big urban areas are transforming themselves really rapidly into big technological hubs. And that's certainly true of New York. New York has been the second largest center of innovation in the United States and one of the largest in the world now for at least a decade. And the jobs of tomorrow are technology jobs, not financial jobs per se. So instead of decrying the fact that the financial jobs might not sustain the city in the future, we should be embracing the future, which is right here, and it's all about technology. Now, in the case of Amazon, to some degree, it's understandable. You've seen big other technology companies like Google and Facebook and, and others expand in New York City without having to ask for favors or tax breaks. And so this, this issue is, I understand, very sensitive. But on the other hand, Amazon is proposing to install itself in a impoverished neighborhood that, we, you know, that needs revitalization, need, needs renewal. And the politicians are, once again, not being very imaginative. Instead of saying, we'll give you $3 billion in, in, in tax cuts, they should have said, in, in lieu of tax cuts, we will invest that money that you will bring to us in additional taxes we will invest it in the subway. We'll invest it in better education. We'll invest it. But instead, it's in this amorphous uh, tax break. And I think that's what people are revolting against. You and your partners must have been watching over the last year this dalliance that Amazon had with cities across the country. It's, it's all about where the worker or worker of the future is and the number of workers or of employees necessary to grow the future of a big company like Amazon. It's not going to happen in mid-sized cities or smaller cities. The, the, the population is just not big enough to sustain uh, and to educate the worker of tomorrow. So you have to look at the bigger urban areas, and there aren't that many of them. Uh, obviously, New York is, is, a, is a prime example. So this whole issue of creating the right environment so that kids who are growing up today, and particularly kids who are in middle school, being exposed to coding, being exposed to learning about technology, because those are the jobs that when they graduate, not only from high school, but also from college, those are the jobs that will be available to them, and those are really well-paying jobs. So Amazon is right in, in targeting New York and coming to New York. I don't think that they had exactly the right political sensitivities. Talking about political sensitivities and New York State, I was looking at your tweets over the last few days. You were tweeting about IBM's $2 billion investment in New York's research hub for artificial intelligence, about 120 miles north of here in Albany. How does the corridor between Albany and Manhattan compare to the distance from San Francisco to Palo Alto? It's, it's very different. What happens in upstate New York is you have great educational institutions, not only around Albany, but also, you know, Ithaca and all this. And this is why when Bloomberg was, was our mayor and he decided to have this competition to bring an advanced en engineering school into New York City, ultimately it was won by a combination of Cornell uh, in conjunction with the Israeli Institute of Technology. So really a great combination. So again, it shows you the importance of education and the importance of technology education in particular. So I think upstate New York has a great future, but not in the manufacturing jobs, not in the, the kind of the old traditional jobs which are, have been lost and lost forever, but in, in order to really keep the people that are graduating in those wonderful colleges upstate to try to keep those people to stay closer to where they, they learn and where they were educated. Just also on a lighter note, watching your Twitter feed over the last couple of days, I saw you tweeted over the weekend about these ads that we've been seeing for Mirror, hoping to catch on to the Peloton craze with what the New York Times in its headline called the most narcissistic exercise equipment ever. So Peloton's got some competition. First of all, it's not a zero-sum game. I, I think the movement of, ad, of providing 
relatively expensive services, particularly in terms of physical fitness and all the, the new machines and uh, soul cycle and flywheel and so on, providing those services at home is, is a big, big trend. And it's going to include many more people who might not be able to go out of their home for whatever reason. So this is a different area. This is an area of yoga and, and Pilates and even boxing, which Peloton doesn't obviously attract with their machines. So Mirror is, is a, is a you know, wonderful piece of technology created by a founder who is incredibly passionate about this field, who has herself started a number of gyms and, and studios, and she's bringing everything that she knows uh, you know, across this mirror, which basically brings the instructor and brings the classes right into your home. You have an investment in Mirror? Uh, we, yeah, we, we were seed investors, yes. Your past roles, Eric, include CEO of the Huffington Post, managing partner at SoftBank Capital, chairman and CEO of Ziff Davis, former publisher of computer magazines. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Growing up, you lived in Switzerland, France, England, and Brazil. Your parents were globetrotters? My, my father was a journalist. He was a journalist first at United Press International, and then he became an executive. So he would move, and he loved his work. And, and I was a journalist, too. I started my career as a photojournalist, first in France, and then I was the editor-in-chief of the local English-language newspaper in Brazil, which doesn't exist anymore. It was called the Brazil Herald. And this world of journalism, which is a world of curiosity and, and investigation and finding out, is what ultimately led me to really love investments, because you're constantly you know, turning stones and figuring out what the future is going to look like. And so it's a, it's a natural extension of journalism in many ways. You dropped out of the Sorbonne at age 20 to pursue your career in journalism and publishing. Would you have done that had you not had your father's experience at UPI and the other places that he stopped in his career? I think I would have dropped out anyway. These, you know, I, I graduated high school in, 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 U, in the UK, in London, went to the Sorbonne, and it was, it was 1969 and 1970, and it was very difficult to attend classes because it was the continuation of the 1968 revolution and the classes were being interrupted all the time. Uh, so I took a job during the day and went to school at night, and that was really not very satisfactory. My parents lived in Brazil, I lived in France, and I just bought a one-way ticket to uh, Rio and, uh, and stayed there for 15 years. An old Bloomberg article from 1997 describes you, Eric Hippo, this way. Though you've probably never heard of him, Eric Hippo is among the most influential people in the computer industry. Just ask Bill Gates, who brainstorms with him about potential products, or Michael Dell, who relies on him to spread the word on new wares. So 97, Eric, it's the heyday of America Online, AOL, with its headquarters in Dulles, Virginia. Many of my fellow White House aides at the time in the Clinton administration wanted to end up there. How did you go from publishing, reporting on technology, talking to people like Michael Dell, to partnering with the biggest names in technology on the next major breakthrough? I launched Brazil's first computer magazine, way back in 1975. So it was, it was a world that, has, that went from mainframes to mini computers and had big implications in large economies like, like Brazil. I sold that business to uh, Pat McGovern, uh, legendary creator of IDC and Massachusetts Computer World. Massachusetts-based. Yeah, and, and, and real, a, a real luminary in terms of the uh, possibility of technology to tr transform societies and economies. And I developed all of our IDG's businesses in Latin America. So we had magazines and trade shows and market research you know, in Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, and, and other places. And eventually, I decided to uh, move to the United States. And luckily, he had a job for me. And I took over a magazine in Menlo Park in the Bay Area called InfoWorld. And InfoWorld was very much the first microcomputer Newspaper. So now you're in an era where you, you're going beyond the mini computer. You now have the very first personal computers. And IDG's uh, InfoWorld was more of a consumer magazine. And the, the rival, which was Ziv Davis, had a magazine called PC Week, uh, which was more of a business magazine. And they had kind of hit it the right way that it turned out the first PCs were really business machines. So 
our job at InfoWorld was to transform InfoWorld from a consumer to a, a professional uh, magazine and compete effectively with PC Week. And we did that and had a lot of fun doing it. And towards the end of the 1980s, Bill Ziff, who uh, at the time, and he and his family owned Ziff Davis, asked me to be the publisher of PC Magazine. And that was a very difficult job to turn down. PC Magazine was the ninth largest magazine in the United States. So imagine a world where the top magazines are Time and Newsweek and People Magazine and Money, very broad-based magazines. And suddenly in ninth position is this incredibly technical magazine. And about two inches thick. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was massive. It was based in New York. This is when I moved to New York. And, and one of the incredible things about that magazine is that we had PC Labs. And PC Labs was a full-blown lab that tested everything that came out, whether it was uh, new pieces of hardware, PCs, and accessories, as well as all the software. And we were kind of the arbiter of what consumers should should buy. And that this is how, and, and, and that lab was based on Park Avenue. You know, it wasn't in Silicon Valley. It wasn't, you know, it was on, it was one Park Avenue. And we had um, a tremendous amount of fun and it was a fantastic business. And a year later, Bill asked me to be the president of the company and then eventually the CEO and, and chairman. So I had the great fortune of growing up with people like, like Bill Gates and, and Michael. We sold Michael Dell's first ads in PC Magazine, and uh, he was our biggest customer for, for, for many, 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 many years. And it was a tremendous moment. It was really where you could see the possibility of having all you know, these personal computers in the hands of, of people. It's like you know, they weren't even as powerful as an iPhone is today, but, and, it, and it wasn't online in those days yet. You mentioned AOL. AOL you know, had started their dial-up service and copy serve and people like this. But if you remember those days, it was incredibly difficult to go online. You, you were online for two minutes and it would break off or you had to use these couplers to put on telephones. And it was, but it was, a, it was a world of incredible possibility. And we also saw in the mid-90s then the birth of the web. Uh, the, the birth of kind of the online world, which w was, you know, foreshadowed what's, what was going to happen. And this is when I invested in Yahoo and uh, US Web. And in those days, we had sold Ziv Davis to SoftBank. And because we were in the middle of everything that went on in technology and really only lived in the tech world, I, I never went to media conferences. I didn't know, really, I, didn't, I knew nobody in media, but I knew everybody in tech. And so we were aware of all these new companies that were coming up, and this is when SoftBank started to, to make their investments. So the, the birth of the web was exhilarating because you literally had thousands and thousands of new sites that popped up uh, on a weekly basis. And now, of course, it's, you know, it's in the millions. And you could start to see really how technology was going to effectively transform pretty much every segment of society. When did you first meet Ken and Ben Lara, and why were they the right partners to form Lara Hippo with? I, I first met Kenny, and, and, and then by default, of course, Ben, when I led the Series A. I was a general partner at SoftBank Capital, and I led the Series A in the Huffington Post. And, of course, Kenny and Ariana were the co-founders. And I was the first institutional investor. I, I joined the board. Huffington Post was incredibly transformative in, in terms of journalism. We published 600 stories a day online. New York Times was publishing 120 in those days. It was way before kind of the trolls had taken over online commentaries. So we had a very constructive, very intellectual sometimes conversations online with readers who participated and and it was the comments it, uh, used to go on for thousands on a breaking HuffPost story. That's right. And and HuffPost by the way was the we invented the format that was there was a limitless bottom. Right. You could just scroll and scroll and scroll. There was no end to it. And that that was true uh, with the comments as well. So these were these were days where th where there was a lot more positive thinking about the future of online media in the sense that it was really going to be a foundation of democracy and everybody was going to have a voice and everybody's going to be respectful. So we were a little, I guess we were a, a little Pollyannish, but we, we managed that. So two years before we sold it to AOL, Kenny and Ariana asked me if I would like to be the CEO. And it was like, because of my journalistic background and my, my love of media, I decided that it was an offer I couldn't refuse. 
Lara Hippo is an early stage venture capital fund, meaning that you're on the front lines making the initial investment in what either could be the next big company or a dream that eventually goes bust. What drew the firm to being the go-to for that initial raise when it's still just pie in the sky? So we, we started to invest. So Kenny Ben, another partner who is not with us anymore, uh, but a good friend, Jordan Cooper, and I started, those days it was called Larry Ventures. And we were really angel investors. We, because we're well known in New York, we had all this, uh, this deal flow and these opportunities to, to make investments. And rather, to, rather than doing this individually, we regrouped our efforts. And it was all individuals and our own money and so on. So this idea that we would be kind of the first to see companies in terms of right after friends and family, right after pure angels, where you have your first institutional money, was really very and continues to be very appealing because you get to pick early and you certainly get to work with companies to build, help build them, help make sure that they're on the right track to raise the next rounds of financing. It really calls to our operating background. All of us have an operating background. It calls to the, you know, how to build companies, which is not an easy thing to do. And I think we've been quite successful. So today, we're, we're seed investors first, although we're far from you know, the amount of money that we're talking about when we were angel investors. You know, now it's, we invest millions of dollars. And we have two funds that can continue to follow the life cycle of the companies until, until the later stage. So when you talk about companies like Allbirds and Casper and uh, Glossier and other companies like this, we participate in pretty much every stage of financing, which then really enhances our returns. You were based in New York coming off of your role at the Huffington Post, but what kept Lara Hippo based in New York City? Why did you specifically invest in New York-based companies? When I was at SoftBank Capital, which was a, a wonderful time and a wonderful group of people, I traveled pretty much every week. I was on the plane somewhere, West Coast a lot, Asia, Europe, uh, et cetera. And I decided that the, the best investing is really done locally. That, that it's really difficult to parachute in into an area, even, if, if, even though you might have really good relationships and good connections, that it's much better to be dealing locally. And, and the people in, in the, you know, the, the big firms on Sand Hill Road have understood this for, for, for many years. You know, it used to be that uh, if your investment was, uh, took you more than 20 minutes by car to get there, you didn't invest. Now, since then, some of them ha- are in China and other places, but by and large, they tend to stick to their you know, kind of region, their local, local place. So it was at the time that New York was booming. There was this other aspect of it, which we call the urbanization of technology, where tech workers decided that they wanted to live in big, ur- dense urban areas. And this is when you start to see the migration of workers from Silicon Valley to San Francisco. And what better dense urban area than New York City? So we felt that it had all the right ingredients, that it appealed to our, our background and what we're good at, which is help build companies. And it's worked out great. Since 2014, Eric, former AOL founder and CEO Steve Case, who oversees the VC firm Revolution in Washington, D.C., has been going cross-country to promote his Rise of the Rest tour, based on the premise that the next great American startups lie outside Silicon Valley, New York, and Boston, which, if you total it all up, receive about 75% of all venture capital in the U.S. Here's what Case says about Rise of the Rest. These Rise of the Rest entrepreneurs are attacking big problems in our society. Improving health care. Reimagining education. Rethinking food and agriculture. Building smart cities. Today, the data is sobering. 75% of all venture capital investments go to just three states. Companies not on the coast are often overlooked. We know that talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. We're trying to change that. We seek to level the playing field so everybody everywhere has a shot at the American dream. Eric, does Steve have a point? Can a CEO with a great idea from Kansas City knock on the door at Hippo Lehrer and have a receptive audience? Uh, sure. And, and we have companies in San Antonio and Austin, and we have a kind of companies in Canada. And 
anybody can have a good idea. You don't, you don't need to be in a big city to have a good idea. You can be anywhere in the world. Now you have access to the same information, the same technology that, as if you were in the big city. So that really, Steve is, is right in that respect. The issue though is when, when you start scaling a company, and you need to hire the next 20 engineers and the next salespeople or growth hackers or you know the kind of workers that you need in tech, you are not likely to find them in small communities. It's just not going to happen. And, and so what's going to happen is likely you're going to have to open a big center somewhere else or you're going to have to move your company somewhere else because that's where your employees are going to be. So that's, that's really kind of the, the issue. And we still have to see you know, cons- consistent examples of companies coming from much smaller localities have great exits. All is not rosy on the publishing front, Eric, despite continuing to break a lot of news. I loved this long-form BuzzFeed story over the last few weeks that I read on the unbelievable story of the plot against George Soros. BuzzFeed announced it would cut 15% of its staff, while Verizon announced it was laying off 7% of its media division, which includes employees at Yahoo, AOL, and HuffPost, which it had all rolled up. The story is equally bleak in some ways at Condé Nast and the former Time Inc., where the Time and Fortune brands were spun out by Meredith to deep-pocketed owners. Having previously served as the CEO of the Huffington Post and as the current board member of BuzzFeed, what's your take on the changing media landscape? Is journalism dying a slow death or does it still have fight left in it when people like Jeff Bezos are paying the bills? So there's a lot in, in, in this issue, uh, you know, having to do with people who are late to the party in terms of going digital and the small newspapers not surviving and not being replaced by local news. So there's, there's, there's a lot going on here, and hopefully people will continue to debate this. The largest pure digital media companies have had to make some adjustments in the past few years because the advertising business the, the, has basically gone to the two big tech giants. You Facebook know, Google, and Google. Free Facebook and Google. And they have proven to be very bad partners or very poor partners to the content people. They, they offer content for free, but they don't really give you much in return. The other facet of this is that advertising has gone almost all technology. So that uh, programmatic advertising, which is all served by computers, very much like what you do here at the stock exchange for financial products, is really kind of has become the dominant way for people to advertise. And so as a result, companies like Group9 and BuzzFeed have had to make some adjustments and have opened up new areas of revenue, whether it's commerce and licensing brands or creating content for licensing in the, on a, in the studio fashion accepting programmatic advertising. And both these companies that I mentioned are both growing and, and growing very nicely. But these grow, you know, nobody grows in a straight line. Uh, people grow in spurts, then there's a bit of a plateau. You grow, you know, if I look back at the history of Yahoo, it's, it's a classic. You know, you go, you, you plateau for a year, et cetera, and you have to constantly make pivots and make adjustments. So this is what really what you're seeing. Both of these companies are gonna be doing very well. They have a large audience. Both of them have big journalistic organizations. And once in a while, unfortunately, you have to make some some trimming. But I don't think that it is in any way a sign that journalism is not going to be thriving in the future. There is an issue about the relationship that the media has with Google and Facebook. And, you know, as long as Facebook in particular is in the business of publishing content for free and not delivering anything in return, then we have to live through this situation. Over at your offices, when you see news over the last five years where Jeff Bezos buys the Washington Post, Mark Benioff buys Time, and Emerson Collective buys Atlantic, is this cause for applause or cause for concern? I think it's cause for for applause. And in the case of the Washington Post, they since Jeff Bezos has owned it, they have hired hundreds of more journalists, maybe even a thousand new journalists. They have gone all in on their digital editions. They have broken uh, tremendous stories. Now, in in many ways, because of of the Trump administration, this is kind of also, you know, a, a very fertile ground. Right now, they, they, you know, this you mentioned in your introduction about Jim Van der Heer and Mike Allen and, and Roy Schwartz, whom we've backed and uh, in, in Axios, 
they've done incredibly well, but the, 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 the world that they report on is incredibly rich in content. So I, I think you're seeing journalism at its best. You're seeing uh, journalists really dig in and investigate and tell the truth and tell the truth to power, which is not an easy thing to do. So in the case of Jeff Bezos and Washington Post, uh, kudos. It was a, a publication that was uh, dying. The previous owners did not know how to go to, to digital. They, they were cutting back. They, they were cutting back sections. They were cutting back staff. And he has completely revitalized it. And he is not the editor-in-chief. You know, he's not there telling them what to do. He's giving them the, the platform and the resources to do what they need to do. After the break, we'll talk with Eric on the outlook for venture capital this year, 2019 and beyond. That's right after this. Our mission is to bring the world together through live experiences. We're focused on building a technology enablement platform for event creators, lower the friction and cost of creating an event, and increase the rate of success for event creators all over the world. We're a global inclusive company in 11 different countries. This really marks a new chapter for Eventbrite and it feels like the starting line. Eventbrite now listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Back now with Eric Hippo, managing partner at venture capital firm Lehrer Hippo. Before the break, we were talking about some of his firm's investments springing from Eric's golden gut. You've said that when considering an investment, you ask the following question. One, is it the right team? Two, is it the right idea? Three, is the timing right? Are there any companies or industries that you regret not investing in? We had an opportunity to invest in Uber. We didn't do it. I'm not going to share the reasons here, but it's a good example. And part of it, we felt that the, the black car industry was going to be too difficult to unify or to transform. We were wrong. Part of what we do is we're going to be proven wrong. We're going to invest in companies that are not going to make it. We're going to miss good opportunities. And, you know, our world is one where you, you just, if you start looking back, you're, you're going to make yourself miserable. So we only look forward. Take us through this investment philosophy, these three rules that we just talked about. One, is it the right team? You're walking into a room, you're about to be pitched. How can you tell? My first question to everybody who comes to see me is, who are you? And tell me who you are and tell me why you decided to start this company. And I, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for a, a really deep down personal reason, something that has really struck the founder in the gut, you know, very personally. And, and as a result, that founder or that founding team have decided to drop whatever they, they were doing, embark on a very risky adventure, which is to start a company. As you know, a lot of companies fail. But they, they had to do it. It was, it was something that, you know, they, they would have regretted the, their entire life if they hadn't do it, done it. That's what I'm looking for. So two, is it the right idea? How can you tell that? I think what happens is we talk to about 2,500 companies every year, and we make about 20 new investments. So we have a, you know, a high threshold. And you, you do this year in, year out, you're going to get some sort of a pattern recognition going on. And I think that kind of the big audacious idea, the one that seems realistic, and we'll get to time in a second, often it kind of hits you. Wow, yes, it's absolutely true. This, this is, in fact, has a huge potential. And also, you're looking for an idea that has a, at least a national impact, not a regional impact, because you, you're looking for you know, something that will address a multi-billion dollar market. Because it's so difficult to get going, you need to be in, in a very, very big environment. Again, sometimes we, we miss it, and we always work as a team. So this is not me you know, making decisions. We, we, we have four partners, we have a team of almost 20 people, and everybody gets a chance to, to decide together. And if people are, you know, people can either pound the table in favor or they can pound the table against. And we're not going to go, if, if there's enough of our team that feel that this is uh, wrong, we're not going to go against that. So, but by and large, you kind of recognize a good idea when you see it. And you, you, you might not have thought about it. So three, your final rule, is the timing right? Ten years ago, President Obama comes into office. He's the first person to get into Air Force One and go off to Selectron and other solar companies and say, now is the time for solar and wind. Might not have been the time back then. It is very much now. 
That's right. So this is a good example. What happens when when Obama did that is that the the cost of these panels was you know really very 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 high, and so you were basically creating these big manufacturing plants at these super high costs because the raw materials were very expensive. And you were only going to be able to serve a tiny, a small part of the marketplace. You go today, and uh, we have a company in the, solar sp- in, the, in the solar space, and today, any home that you know, has a decent amount of sunshine during the year can afford and finance a solar panel installation and, in many cases, generate surplus energy that could be then sold back into the grid. So this is a good example of what you know, a 10-year difference makes. We've talked about the three rules, but you've also advised that those who've asked you in the past to invest only in areas where one has knowledge. You may not have had great knowledge about eyeglasses or sneakers when you invested in Warby Parker or Allbirds. Does the belief still hold true for you? It does, because what we follow is where digital technology transforms the world, either creates a new market like cannabis or transforms a, a world like sneakers that's been around for, for a long time. So that we understand the power of digital technology. We don't necessarily understand the sneaker market, but we understand that if you have the right product, the right brand, and if you know how to sell it online, you're going to be able to build a big business. Looking through some of Lara Hippo's past investments, a number have been acquired. For example, voice messaging app Cord was acquired by Spotify. Search engine software Moat was acquired by Oracle. Email marketing platform Rebel was acquired by Salesforce. Those are all ticker symbols right here at the New York Stock Exchange, SPOT, ORCL, and CRM. Eric, you're no stranger to the acquisition world with Ziff Davis having been acquired by SoftBank Capital that you mentioned earlier. You ran Huffington Post prior to its acquisition by AOL. We talked about that earlier. Do you see these acquisitions in your portfolio as a success or does that sever the investment life cycle and they become subsumed by their acquire? No, we we see them very much as a success. And certainly if you look at the uh, multiple returns that we get on the ones that you just mentioned, they're at the top of what you would expect the VC return to be. We're proponents of selling at the right time. We're, We're not proponents of selling at the right price. We feel that when an incumbent company is looking to buy and add capabilities, and mostly because they cannot develop them in-house or because the target company uh, has already built a big moat and a big company, then uh, what's going to happen is that all the competitors in that field are basically within the period of a few months going to be making their, their acquisitions. If you do not participate in that phase, you're likely to be kind of the lone tech company without a home, and it might not end well. So you've got to know when to sell. And there used to be advice in Silicon Valley was, oh, you can, you can wait forever because we have an infinite amount of private capital. You don't have to worry about capital. But that has changed in the past few years because the holding time of private companies has gone up from, let's say, five to seven years to more like seven to 10 years. And ultimately, uh, venture capitalists are in the business of returning capital to their own limited partners, to their own investors. And 10 years is basically the life cycle of, of a given fund. You can always ask for extensions. But you're bumping against kind of the, the, the ceiling here. And I think p- people realize that there is a good time to sell. And certainly when buyers come to you, do not worry about leaving the last dollar on the table. Just sell at a reasonable price and uh, everyone will be happy. The decision some of these founders make as they approach their 10-year anniversary when they may become tech unicorns, either getting acquired outright or tapping the public market, the one that we run here, for instance, we're looking at 2019. It may be time for Uber, Airbnb, Slack, and others to say, let's offer this investment to the public. Your view on the decisions that founders make between let's sell if the price is right or the time is right to another company, or let's roll the dice and see what public investors have to say about it? I think there's a fear, or maybe the fear is starting to be a little less, but there's been a fear about going public. And I think that this needs to be demystified. This idea that it's hard, 
it's expensive, you know, you, the quarterly reports are going to limit your ability to think about the future. I think this is all wrong. And I, and I think what the, the benefit that you, go, you get by going public, a new currency, new investors, liquidity for your employees who are vested, the ability to uh, be a little bit more disciplined, all of these are, you know, very, very good attributes. And more companies should be encouraged to go public. The issue is that we there's still a lot of late stage private capital that needs to go to work, and that's pushing back against the uh, the timetable of going public earlier. Let's talk about something that didn't have such a happy ending. In 2015, Lara Hippo invested in luggage company Raiden. It was beautifully designed. I looked at some of the videos with a sleek and modern style. It had GPS capability and 3G connectivity. Yet it faced two problems, Eric. The first was the rise of luggage competitor Away, which offered a similar product at a slightly lower price with a marketing campaign that was made for Instagram. The second was smart luggage ban on airplanes, people not wanting to have the lithium ion batteries in the planes. Both Radon and Away featured removable batteries in the suitcases, but at the end of the day, Away's process for battery removal was easier and Radon shuttered last May. While the events leading up to its closure were difficult to predict, what's the lesson from an investment like this? It's true that Raiden was outmarketed by a way, and that's, that's one of the lessons of a direct-to-consumer product, which is, by the way, direct-to-consumer products are really enabled. The, re- the rise of these products is, was enabled by social media. And so you really have to be really attuned to social media and the changes in social media. I believe that a way really took advantage in a good way of the rise of Instagram, whereby Raiden was probably not really focused too much on Instagram, was maybe a little bit more on Facebook and and Twitter. So those those things can make a very big difference, as we've seen. But ultimately, they were doomed by the regulators and and, and maybe in a legitimate way. You know, the, 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 the fact is that these batteries are inflammable. And you don't want um, one of these batteries to explode inside the cockpit. I don't know that you want it to explode, uh, to explode in the hold compartment either. <laughs> but suddenly there was this fear. So the combination of the two, as you mentioned, kind of doomed the company. Uh, the product was really great. I see those, uh, those cases still being carried around. And by the way, Away is basically a regular case now. It, uh, they, th- because of these ban on, on, on the batteries and technology, they really compete competing against uh, Samsonite and, uh, and the other brands, and, but they've done a good job. 2019 has just begun. As you look around within this three-mile circumference around the New York Stock Exchange, Silicon Alley, what's happening here in New York City? Are there industries that you've got a watchful eye on, things that might not yet be so much in the public eye? There, there's a lot going on in digital health, which we feel is, is very important. There's two really big things. I'm going to say three. The third is probably impossible. But the two big things that really need to be changed in our society, one is healthcare, for all the obvious reasons. And a lot of it has to do with the complete inefficiency. Most of them are built in to the system that increases the price of everything. So digital, digital technology comes in and offers a way of for transparency and better information and and the elimination of a lot of intermediaries but unfortunately the the healthcare business is has all these these big powerful factions that hang on to their power but over time digital is what's going to free all of this up and kind of redo it so that's one area the the area the other and we make investments in that because we're very optimistic about that the ability to transform that world the world that we're not as optimistic, which needs a lot of transformation, is education. And that one leaves me with a little bit of despair, as we talked about earlier, because the more we wait, the more we waste the opportunity for this current generation and the next generation. But that world is in, it's, it's in a sclerotic mode. You, you've got a combination of uh, government and unions that have a, a complete lock and they don't have the best interest of the kids. But if you were able to free up that world and let innovation come in, you know, they, in China, most education is moving online very, very rapidly. This is going to give them a tremendous advantage. There's a couple of massive companies in China that all they do is teach English. 
to people in China, mostly children, it wouldn't be possible to... Some of them are listed right here in the New York Yeah, Science exactly. Center. And it wouldn't be possible for you to create, you know, I don't know, 100,000 English teachers overnight to go in all the schools in China and teach English. But you can do this online. And we don't do any of this in the United States. The third, of course, is the government, which is in bad need of reform and bad need of you know, an infusion of digital technology, but that that's another world. Well, and, Bradley uh, Tusk <laughs> sat here and talked about the rise of online voting and beginning at very small baby steps now, but the ability for so many more people to get engaged if we can change the way governments loosen the stranglehold they have on the ability for people to register to vote, that could change everything. Good luck with that. So if that problem, Eric, is somewhat intractable, at least for now, data showed that in 2017, 2.2% of venture capital funding went to female-founded companies, while just over 11.3% of partners at venture capital firms are female. Not only has Lara Hippo backed the most female-founded companies in the New York metro area, you also hired four female employees to your tightly run ship. What's your advice on supporting female founders and leveling the playing field in general? Well, it's not, it's not just uh, female. We, we're also trying very hard to find more minority founders. Although, arguably, I mean, about half of our companies has at least one member of the founding team that um, is an immigrant. And a lot of them, you could maybe characterize them as, um, as uh, minorities in one way or the other. But th there's, no, there's no silver bullet. I, I think that you have to make a determination to be a little bit more diversified. There's no question about that. You have to go look for the talent. And there's a lot of talent uh, out there. And venture capital is great because venture capital, you know, you don't need to be in the office nine to five, right? You, um, a lot of my colleagues and myself, we, we are kind of out in visiting people and going to conferences and going to meetups and those kinds of things. And I think that that kind of lifestyle lends itself really well for perhaps women who have a family, and who need to find that kind of balance between the family and work. And we found some terrific colleagues who are women, and, and uh, some of them are on the path to become partners in our fund. Let's take a listen to CNBC's Carl Quintanilla on two industries that you invested in last year, blockchain and robotics. Uh, Eric, I want to talk about your, your two funds you just closed on blockchain and robotics, because we've seen some incredible, at least, plans over the past few days on 5G, right? Talked about the possibilities there. Uh, Boston Robotics, Musk Tunnels in uh, California. What do you see happening and what are you trying to what are you trying to capture? Well, so as you know, we're the most active early stage investors based in New York, and we primarily invest in New York-based companies. Uh, so in terms of the blockchain and robotics, uh, what we're seeing is, is that um, because New York is really great at applications and services built on existing platforms, we're seeing a community of blockchain developers, a community of robotics developers really establish themselves in New York looking at building really great services on these existing platforms. And, and we're going to be dedicating a part of our efforts with this new funds uh, towards that. Based on things that are available now? Yes, like the blockchain, for instance. In robotics, what's interesting is that New York has a, a nascent 3D printer technology. We were early, stage, early investors in MakerBot, for instance. Out of that community comes commoditized hardware uh, that people who design robots are now utilizing. And you, you can build incredibly useful robots now for five, ten thousand $10,000 that would have cost $100,000, $150,000 just a few years, uh, a few years ago. Has Lara Hippo continued investing in blockchain? What should we expect out of the robotics industry, specifically in the area of artificial intelligence? We, we never really invested a lot in the blockchain. We never invested in the crypto, in the crypto world. Uh, we were always very skeptical. We felt and we still feel that the idea of decentralized internet, which is really what the blockchain is all about, uh, has merit. It could be a timing issue. The, the technology is uh, very rough around the edges. The tools are, for the most part, non-existent. And, and the cost uh, of these platforms has gone up tremendously based on maybe what is a flawed concept, which is this idea of mining and the idea that every transaction has to be going through the miners and you have to pay them a fee. So whereby a transaction would cost you, in the early days of blockchain, a few cents, 10 cents, 20 cents, now it's costing you a few dollars. And it makes a lot of the applications uh, uh, not you know, worth it. We'll continue to study and we'll maybe 
jumping back in when the, when the timing is right. Robotics is a different matter because robotics is part of this bigger world of automation and artificial intelligence. And robotics was always, um, it's, it mirrors very much what the computer world was, where you had the mainframes, you had IBM and Burroughs and Univac. The, these were incredibly complex, incredibly expensive machines. And it was only with the advent of the micro computer and the PC that it became democratized. And I think we're, we're, we're the, uh, if you look at the photos of the robots that uh, build cars, for instance, you see these massive arms, and, and they're, they're, there's only like four manufacturers in the world, and each one of these arms costs in excess of $150,000. Very hard to program. You have to call a white lab technician to come and change the, uh, uh, the settings on those machines. And contrast that with the, the, the world that is opening up now, where you have these much smaller commoditized hardware machines that might cost you know, a few thousand dollars, where all the IP is in the software, and the software is almost as easy to use as uh, your phone. So that's the world that we're going into, and we see tremendous opportunity in that world. And we have you know, uh, uh, three or four investments there, and we'll continue to look for uh, other opportunities. What advice, as we wrap up, do you have for entrepreneurs looking to make that initial pitch coming into the room with someone like you and Ken? Well, we, we don't take cold meetings. So every day we get deluged with people on email, on Facebook, on whatever ways that they can find us to try to convince us to take a meeting, and we won't do it. We only take meetings if those people are introduced to us by someone we know. And we feel that that's the, the right way to do First of all, we couldn't possibly have the time or the resources to take every meeting. And secondly, we feel that if, if you, we have a vast network of people who know us. And if you cannot find someone who will say, hey, I know Joe, Joe's a good guy or, or you know, a good person, uh, you know, take a meeting, then you're, you're, you're not doing your own due diligence, you're not doing your own homework, and we want you to take that first step. They've taken the first step, they've made that interstitial connection, they've got a meeting with you. What do they have to do that day to bring their A game? What are you really gonna look for across the table? We, we look for a, a simple explanation of what they do. Our meetings are only half an hour by design. We want to get to the core. Now we ask uh, for materials in advance, we, we do our homework before the meeting. So we, we have a, a fairly decent idea as to what's gonna be talked about. And we want the, the founders, uh, the, the creators, to give us the elevator pitch. You know, tell us simply, what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish and why is your solution the right solution? Big explanations, data, charts, it's, it's not gonna you know, help tell us what is the core of what you're trying to accomplish. All right, founders out there, work on your elevator pitches. Eric Hippo, thank you so much for joining us inside the Ice House. Thanks, Josh. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Eric Hippo, managing partner of Lara Hippo. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at NYSE. Our show is produced by Teresa DeLuca and Ian Wolf, with production assistance from Ken Abel and Stephen Portner. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 